I was born in the Soviet Union in the 70s uh, in a pretty typical family. We um, lived in a standard issue, five-story uh, high house that uh, came from the Khrushchev era. And uh, while everybody here played with Legos, I played with little plastic blocks that were basically the model of these houses. They were assembled in giant factories and then brought in place and built up uh, by machines. I had a very normal television that was, of course, black and white. I was a little bit jealous of my grandmother who managed to get a color TV from, uh, from the West. And she even had a thing called a VCR that was quite unusual, an unusual device at that time. I also went to a very typical school, and all the kids were, wore uniform. We all tried to look alike. My goal in the first three years was probably to be in the first batch of uh, the young communist pioneers. It was a great honor to be uh, accepting this, uh, this title in the first batch. It happened in Red Square only for the first uh, group of these kids. Now, I didn't succeed at that, uh, probably because I was a Jew. My uncle was your average nuclear rocket scientist. He built ballistic missiles. That is something that he told me only once he was smuggled by the Mossad out of uh, the Soviet Union in the early 90s. And this is a story he would tell in Haifa casually. And my father, who is on the right, uh, was a Russian intellectual, poetry translator, and um, he was, in the 80s, he joined the very prestigious Writers' Union, uh, which was hard, really hard to get into. And that meant that we would get a parcel every month uh, with vodka and caviar. And maybe we were allowed to listen to the BBC or Voice of America and even have contacts with foreigners, something that was really difficult at that time. We also had books that were forbidden for which other people will go, would go to jail. My grandfather helped a lot with that. He was a propaganda writer. As far as I know, and he had many, many secrets, he invented heroes of war. He was a journalist during World War II, and then he just continued writing about all these stories that became less and less true with time. He was the first one to tell me that everything around me was a lie. He also helped my mother get a wonderful job, which was reading scientific papers uh, from the West, editing them and forwarding them to Russian academics. This should resonate quite ironically with the government reviewing scientific documents today before publication. It's not a new concept at all. Not everything was fake, though. My other grandmother was a chemistry, chemistry uh, teacher in a plain Russian school. My grandfather, my other grandfather, was a Russian war hero. He commanded a battleship during World War II, and then he became a school headmaster. He was a highly decorated hero of the USSR. So I grew up as this normal kid, really proud of our Soviet achievements, looking at all these wonderful things around me. I was particularly proud about our industry, about the machines we made. And these machines, they protected us from evil imperialists, and they also managed to send a man to space. And what was awesome is that those machines even planned to bring that man back to Earth and actually succeeded at that. It was a great moment. Most machines and most people worked in five-year plans, and incredibly, they were able to achieve all these goals in four years. Should sound familiar as well. This was amazing. Then eventually, I realized that we lived in some kind of robot society. Um, once I grew up, I figured that most people just did what they were told to do. There was very little individuality in them. And so to survive in this environment, a lot of people turned to art. So I started doing art in school very early. I was, of course, in all the school performances and all the theater. And then as I grew up, my parents uh, brought me to things like Sleeping Beauty at the Bolshoi Theater, and I would yawn, and I was bored, and I really didn't like it, but now I understand how incredible that was. We went to Tretyakov Gallery, which housed uh, the world's most exceptional 20th century art with Malevich's Black Square and other pieces, and uh, we read a lot of books. And my father, being a poetry translator, I just helped him type on a mechanical typewriter with two fingers 
all these first copies that he had to submit to the publishing houses. The Xerox machine was total science fiction. I was the Xerox machine copying poems again and again and again on this mechanical typewriter. It took me years to unlearn to type on a real keyboard with my 10 fingers. We also painted. My father went to art school, and so he would take me to Moscow suburbs, to various parks, and I made hundreds and hundreds of watercolors. So our life was so great by so many measures, and I always wondered, why did we, why did my family do so well? How were we able to have so much art in our lives? And um, it only, I only understood what was happening when I once got quite sick, and the doctor came to visit me immediately and gave me the medicine that was prescribed. I wondered, how did we actually get the doctor to come? And I noticed that my dad paid the doctor in books. In my time, money was absolutely worthless. Everybody kind of had access to all these things, at least in theory. But what made the difference was the art. And so for me, the books, the art, was actually money. It was like a currency. In fact, it, for me personally at that time, it was like Obamacare, like health insurance. So here we are, 100 years later, after the Soviet Revolution, and I think that history is about to repeat itself. If anything, the US elections are echoing, very ironically, my experience in the USSR. And I feel like we are about to live in some kind of virtual reality again, one where people are completely disengaging from society, one where they're just going through the motions. They believe anything that the system feeds them in a convenient feed of information, something digestible, something really easy. In the Soviet Union, I learned nothing was real, and increasingly what I see around me is hard to believe and seems completely virtual. Automation is totally replacing work. That sounds awesome. You know, machines, they don't ask questions. They don't take vacations. They don't need any breaks. They don't complain. And they don't even need a five-year plan. They just work all the time. In the Soviet Union, religion was not allowed. In the US, religion is an all-time low as well. People don't go to churches, to synagogues, mosques as much. Um, and in the Soviet Union, everything was distributed through some kind of propaganda instead. Well, we have our new propaganda. Uh, code and data is our new religion. We even have our priests to convince us that that is true. I think we can just remove the humans from uh, all, the, all the decisions around us. In the USSR, the party decided everything about our social and economic life. I think AI and code can replace all of our life. They can at least control all of it. And in that magical world, just like in the USSR, there will be opportunity for all. My adoptive Switzerland, to which I moved in 1990, has already voted for universal basic income, and I think we're going to see that quite soon. So what are we going to do once the machines are doing everything? Now, of course, if social science taught us anything, once all our basic needs are met, once we have enough to eat and we don't need to actually do anything, self-actualization is going to become a necessity. What that means is that art is going to go from leisure, from a luxury, to a real need. So you'll ask, should we all become artists? Now, I don't think so. I don't think we all are going to start making art, although I encourage everybody to, to do it. Uh, but art and artists are going to become much more important. In fact, what's interesting is that we are already seeing artists and art coming from really interesting places around the world, and all of that crossing the oceans, crossing the divides, crossing the new borders, going over the walls. This is an image of an Iraqi artist who has been selected for the 2017 uh, Venice Biennale, uh, and uh, she's going to be featured in the Iraqi, uh, Iraqi family, her, uh, pavilion. Her name is Tamara Khalabi. This means with more artists, we're going to need more patrons. It used to be kings and other notables that were encouraging, supporting, paying artists. I think venture capitalists are going to be next. I believe that artists will start being very similar to startups. 
And um, we're going to see more people support these artists and support these startups for all kinds of reasons. This image is from women, an exhibition, a traveling exhibition by the iconic photographer Annie Leibovitz. And in, this is completely financed by UBS, the Swiss bank, a new kind of art patron. With more art and with more people who have the means to collect art, in fact, anybody in this room can afford art, but probably most of you don't buy any art, we're going to start buying a lot more art. We're going to get more art. We're going to gift more art. We're going to have more original art in our lives. And for those who don't buy art, they're going to hoard street signs uh, from the streets. I have quite a large collection. My largest one is 17 feet by seven. It's a parking sign from 15th Street in East Village that took me a lot of time to drag up the stairs and try to turn around the corners. Uh, we can just declare that art. Uh, the collectors here, uh, Herb and Dorothy, spent all their lives on their average middle class salary buying art and eventually amassing a collection that was deemed the most important contemporary art collection in the 20th century. Their apartment was 600 square feet filled with art. With more collectors, it means that there will be created many more dealers. These are, this is a new gallery. Um, Dominique Levy, who is uh, a really famous art dealer, joined forces with someone from almost the other side. Uh, who is uh, Brett Gorvey from an auction house, an auction specialist. And these will be new kinds of dealers that are going to combine deep expertise, use of data, more transparency, better customer service, faster response time, efficient transactions, and all the other elements that we see in other industries. We'll need people to walk around and look at art and tell us how bad it is. And so more critics will appear that will have an opinion about everything. And they will tell us about it through all the new media and all the new information. Uh, this is uh, Anthea Hamilton, who was shortlisted for, uh, for the Turner Prize. From drinking wine at galleries, which is fun, we're going to go to more curated experiences, more produced events, things that are going to blow our mind increasingly. Uh, this is an event that Artsy co-produced with SoundCloud and Gucci at Art Basel, Miami 2016, where instead of wearing uh, virtual reality goggles, the virtual reality images were projected on top of a dome, a huge dome. Uh, it's a way to experience VR without glasses, but this was entirely powered by VR artists. Rachel Rosson was one of them, and she uh, lip sang the singer who was part of this experience. And this is the first time some of the people there have experienced virtual reality at all. The number of institutions that are going to try to build legacy in the art world is going to increase dramatically. In China, in 2009, there were 2,600 uh, private museums. By 2014, there were 4,700. And that pace is accelerating 3x. More people, once they've amassed enough wealth and are starting buying art, they will want to leave legacy for their children, something to house that art, something to show it to everybody, somebody to make it available to everyone. So there will be more and more public and private institutions all over the world building such legacy. And of course, there will be people who want to flip some art and speculate on it. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is Simkovic, uh, or we know him as, uh, as Simko, a man who's already been called the Donald Trump of the art world in just the recent few days, but also the New York Times called him the world's art Satan, or a Sith Lord. And uh, he is the most controversial figure in speculating about art. We'll need to know what we buy, and so more experts will be there. But these experts are going to use new tools. They're really going to look deep with new technology. And we're also going to use things like blockchain to authenticate primary market art, where artists will be able to attach that information to the works uh, from the very beginning. And provenance will not be a problem anymore. What's more encouraging, though, is that parents today, parents like myself, are spending more time and more money trying to get more art into schools. We're going to see more educators, more people that want to create an inspiring environment for the children, teach them about art. 
And all of those children will grow up and become art appreciators like I was when I was a kid in the Soviet Union. We're going to go to more museums and just enjoy art. If you go to the MoMA right now on a weekend, it's almost impossible to get in. There's so many people that are going there. And this is growing really fast. Museums are growing very fast. But we're not there yet. The art industry, especially at the very top, is controlled by rich, fancy, white people. They have all the power. And that power is not going to be questioned by protest. That power is just going to be questioned by cultural progress. The first thing to change, and that is already happening, is access to art. And of course, I would claim that there's a lot of access online, but there's also a lot of access in the real world. For example, this, um, this installation by Cristo called Floating Piers is an almost unknown region in Italy. It had 1.6 million people visit it in 16 days. And anybody from Europe could, could easily go there for very little money. And it's open to the public. So that information is disseminated by social media, and people go and experience the art. And so this experience and the, uh, the art of this visual culture, things we can touch, things we can experience, is going to grow. And so from small projects, this is my camps project at Burning Man 2003, which was just a bunch of crazy people trying to build a sculpture, a replica of the Athens Parthenon, to more ambitious projects such as Pulse and Bloom, where you can feel your heart uh, on these flowers, where the flowers light up with your heart, to even more ambitious projects that just mimic real life. You know, I took an airplane to come here. I don't see what's so extraordinary about, about this, but maybe in unusual places. All these will leave Burning Man and merge with the, today's art world, and we're going to see them in real life elsewhere. This is an installation by San Shun, uh, a Chinese artist at Art Basel, Miami Beach, just a couple of months ago. This totally belongs at Burning Man, and we're going to see more and more of them everywhere. There will be a lot of resistance and a lot of protectionism from that. In Russia, Pussy Riot went to jail, and so expression and political activism and art in that will become more important. In fact, I think that is the most important multiplier of any kind of political action. Art becomes more important to people. Art is something that people who are totalitarian, the kind of the establishment are really afraid of. It's a very strong multiplier. And of course, we're going to find it online. And we're going to share it all. But the most important thing that will change is the way we experience art. Oh, no audio. This, this is my daughter that looking at a uh, sculpture by Berlinda de Brucke, which is really a tied horse, uh, kind of a tortured animal, really macabre types things, says that she really doesn't like it because it makes her feel really sad. And I asked her, why does it make you feel sad? She said, it's very simple. It's because it looks real and it's just how I feel. So art will make us feel again. Art will make us human again. Here's another one where Ilan is pointing at a sculpture and says, this is an asteroid that just landed on a car and killed a person in that. So it doesn't have to be serious at all. It can just have no message and no purpose. And it will just let our imagination fly. In the end, we'll just experience art. And art will be part of our life every day. And we can just enjoy it for what it is. So to summarize, art will make us happy and sad again. Well, we can remove the limitations of what we see is what we get. We can unlearn to measure art in money, and we can just develop critical thinking around it. We can learn how or relearn how to see art. And if you want to know what the future of art is, take your children to a gallery and then see how they interact with it. Ask them questions and learn from them. And for the first time in many years, Children see art in everything, and they say that everything is art. Thank you.